five seconds to submergence. Submergence deep into the absurd. All right, we got a really exciting podcast today. We have Keegan. He is the host of the Nietzsche podcast. It is uh, honestly one of the best podcasts I've listened to, especially if you want to educate yourself on like all things Nietzsche or Nietzsche. Oh, here's a good question for you, Keegan, before we begin. Um, yeah. How do you pronounce Nietzsche? Yeah, Nietzsche. That's uh, like, yeah, uh, if you so if you're thinking in martial arts terms, like knee and then cha, <laughs> like the sound you make when you uh, <laughs> hit, hit something with a karate chop. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think that's the easiest way to just like uh, phonetically yeah. think think about it, because um, I think it's actually closer to like nature. Um, but I think if you just think Nietzsche. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it really uh, think, think, try and simplify it for yourself when pronouncing yeah. um, other languages and just do your best. And that's like my rule of thumb, because you're probably not going to like, I know, for example, my French and my German probably sounds like it probably grates on native speakers, but you know, I, I'm an, I'm an American, so <laughs> yeah. we have to deal with our lack of linguistic education here. Um, but thank you, man. That means a lot. I, I, I try to, I've tried to approach the podcast from the angle of um, if you know absolutely nothing about f- Nietzsche or even philosophy, uh, it should, I, I want to try and explain it um, to that person, basically, mm-hmm. is who I'm thinking of. Um, yeah. Because it, it's actually, um, I don't know, I, I find it can be more, how would you put it? It can be more challenging, actually, for myself to try and take a step back and think, okay, how would I explain this to somebody who's not thinking in all these abstractions and already knows what like noumena means and knows mm-hmm. what exegesis means and all this stuff? Like, how do I make this interesting for somebody who's maybe completely new to this? So um, hopefully I'm succeeding at least to some extent with some some people rather than them getting sucked down the, uh, what would you call it? Uh, the Either the Jordan Peterson pipeline or the um, the just like, be a selfish asshole and justify it with Nietzsche pipeline um, or, you yeah, know, and all the other, which is not the point. No, no. It's funny because when you, when you look at like the sources, you knew him personally, he was apparently just painfully polite, um, like very um, on top of his like manners, Nietzsche was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he was not just like a, <laughs> He, he didn't use his ideas to as an excuse to go around being a dick to everybody. Um, he was actually kind of maybe even leaned a little too far towards being polite. <laughs> so Yes. Well, it could sort of be a, well, we know from his writings that he wore a mask, right? He, mm. cause like the profound spirit must wear a mask. Right. At least according yeah, he, to Nietzsche. There's that one passage that uh, it escapes me right now where it's from, but where he says that uh, a man who is, uh, you know, actually pretty even tempered could disguise himself with a warlike mustache. And uh, he says repose, as it were, in the shade of that mustache so that he doesn't actually have to display any like aggressive or manly tendencies. He can just sort of let people um, because I guess the the big like thick must walrus mustache was like a staple of militaries in the 1800s around that time. That was the military look, and so he just writes that completely. He doesn't say that's what I do, but it's really obvious when you read that passage that yeah, there's like a kind of a confession there. I mean, he had one of the most ballin mustaches in all of human history, so we'll just say that. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, the best war. The best warrior must mustache on a peacetime mm-hmm. uh, philosopher. <laughs> yes. Although I guess he was a monk during war, so um, yeah. So before we get into those passages that you sent me from all from human all to human, I wanted to ask you. So I know that you're you're a musician, and I want to know if being a musician, uh, if you feel some sort of profound connection with Nietzsche, with him having been a, a musician in his time? 
Uh, a little bit, yeah. Well, I definitely feel a kinship with him insofar as he's trying to I, I sort of do something at the intersection of music and philosophy in his work where he says he's, uh, there's one letter where he says, I it's, you know, endeavored to write more musically than any other philosopher hitherto. Mm-hmm. Um, although, and then he says in the same letter, although I ha- admittedly, I have not been a very successful musician, which is true because um, apparently his music, his compositions, which I think are actually um, quite good um, in some cases, um, you could obviously find flaws in them. Like he's not as yes. good as Wagner, but uh, apparently Wagner just was really dismissive of Nietzsche's music, which I think was kind of unfair. I mean, granted, he's Wagner, so yeah, um, he probably, you know, doesn't have time to waste on amateurish compositions. Mm-hmm. But so anyway, I, I kind of. Uh, um, aside from all that, I really like Nietzsche's music and I, I appreciate what he, the way that he saw writing and being like lyrical in his writing as having a sort of music or rhythm to the way that he wrote and having, um, I don't know, bringing in that element of poetry. There was another letter uh, to Lou Salome where he, he gave her his 10 tips for writing. And he said, you should uh, step right up to poetry without stepping into it. Um, yes. So be as poetic as you can while still remaining in the realm of prose. And so I've like taken all of that um, because, you know, I'm a musician, I'm a writer. I don't know, just seeing that, how would you put it? There, there, is a, there is a way to weave together all the different little creative interests in your life um, mm-hmm. that I think Nietzsche um, was really laudable for. That I think that's that's one of the best things about him actually is his writing style more so than any of the yes. ideas. Um, <laughs> I would say is that he's genuinely a joy to read. Like you pick he up is. some philosophers and it's not fun at all. Nietzsche, it's actually um, really fun, and that's because of his style. Well, it's like watching fire like dance around in a like while you're camping, right? It's just dancing, and you're kind of just mesmerized by it because he mm. he writes with the passion of fire. And that's kind of where that that musical element uh, gets into it, because when you're like writing music, I'm sure or like when you're performing music, especially, I'm sure you're kind of on fire when you're doing that. Yeah. uh, Oh, for sure. I super energetic. I actually think of. I think that that's an aspect of live music that. how, how would I put it? I, I wouldn't say it's been lost because there's definitely big performances you can see, but I would say that there's not, there are not enough musicians who sufficiently understand that like they're performers in the same way. Like, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily compare it to dance, but, um, or the theater, but it is something on that level um, that has to be tied in as well. And so, yeah, it's like really, physical and energetic and you can get that way when you're writing too like yeah you're you just can. struck by an idea the spark is just lit and you just opposite. Sh- yes exactly scribbling. <laughs> yeah or for me clickety clack uh yeah just or, type and type and type for hours hours. and hours mm-hmm. um and i kind of go back and forth yeah it's good to have a little both or, or it's always good to have um like a notebook that you're keeping yes um at the time but yeah, and you know you're like really on fire when you're writing, when you go back and look at it and there's actually not that many typos and stuff. <laughs> like yes. you don't have to actually revise it. Because I have actually got, you know, so there are some times where you're falsely on the course of like some good writing and then you look back at it later. Like that's kind of happens Yeah, your ego kind of just got ahead of you. Right. Well, especially if you're like drinking or writing late at night. Okay, sometimes you, you crank out crazy shit that you never would have written that's gold and sometimes you look back up the next day and you're like this was not good (laughs) yeah or if you're just jacked up like way too much on energy drinks and you just write the most egotistical like paragraph like in human history it's like oh god did i just write that right and some people (laughs) like 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 stephen king could like snort blow all day long and like that's basically responsible for like it being written yeah. It's probably yeah. responsible for a lot of his productivity. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. All right. Well, but, uh, without further ado, let's get into those uh, human all to human passages that you sent me. 
Yeah, they're all about uh, art. Yeah, art, art and religion. Uh, religion. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, kind so, of the relationship with philosophy as well. Yeah. So, um, if you want, I can uh, read all of them, or we can kind of go back and forth. It's up to you. Uh, well, we'll cross a bridge if we get to it. I guess. I guess I'll, I'll, I'm willing to go back and forth. That sounds good. That sounds fair. <laughs> cool. All right. Human all to human, verse 27. Or is this, sorry, aphorism 27. Or yeah, it makes it sound like this is like our, our religion. Yeah. Is, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're Nietzscheans. We're, we're hardcore Nietzscheans. What's our symbol? Is it a, it's a mustache? It's a walrus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> a walrus. <laughs> yeah. It's that painting. It's the Casper David Friedrich painting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, section 27. In spiritual economy, transitional spheres of thought are indeed necessary occasionally for the transition from religion to scientific contemplation is a violent, dangerous leap, something inadvisable. But in the end, we're not to understand that the needs which religion has satisfied, which philosophy is now to satisfy, are not unchangeable. These needs themselves can be weakened and rooted out. Think, for example, of Christian anguish, the sighing about inner depravity, concern about salvation. All of these ideas originate only from errors of reason and deserve not satisfaction, but annihilation. A philosophy can be useful either by satisfying those needs or by eliminating them. For they are acquired needs, temporarily limited, based on assumptions that contradict those of science. It is preferable to use art for this transition, for easing a heart overburdened with feelings. Those ideas are entertained much less by art than by a metaphysical philosophy. Beginning with art, one can more easily move on to a truly liberating philosophical science. Mm. So... He's kind of saying here that if you start with art, you can kind of bring yourself into a sort of philosophical science, sort of a, you can find wisdom by starting with art. Right. So from, that can be the transitional sphere from religion to reason. Um, yes. Yeah, so if you're a religious man, uh, you start you get into art that could kind of bring you towards uh i guess finding wisdom and finding true knowledge i think also how would i put it i think also maybe what he's he's uh touching on that a lot of people would also find relevant today because i think that's certainly true is that you can not just religion but any kind of like dogma Yes. Art has a power to smash through uh, or sear through a lot of presuppositions in a way that mm -hmm. like, having an argument with somebody might not be able to do. Yes. But I think yeah. he's also kind of like pointing to, because so I've mentioned this in the Nietzsche podcast, but Schopenhauer talked about this thing called the metaphysical need. And Kant also kind of believed in this, that everyone would have their, this desire to do metaphysics and think about what's the world beyond, what's the justification for our universe um, what's the first cause, you know, what's the nature of mind and so on and so forth. And so Nietzsche, I think kind of questions that a little bit. It's like, do we really have this metaphysical need or like a religious need, or is this something that can be changed? Can we root, mm -hmm. can we root this out of ourselves? And I think that this period in Nietzsche, what I love about human all to human is it's like his first major book. He's still kind of a little bit more enchanted with the French enlightenment figures. So he's still thinking about the idea of like the sort of utopian vision of moving on from religion to reason, at least for some people like the free spirits. Um, but so I think what he's maybe hinting at here is like, there's modern people out there who are maybe secular or maybe not like faithfully religious, but they still have this like gnawing feeling. Like I have this spiritual hole in my heart that's not being filled. Yes. Like, um, you know, oh, I, okay, I'm not really convinced there's a God. Maybe I wasn't really raised in a religion, but I still 
kind of wonder what happens after I die or what's the meaning of my life. I mean, there's a whole industry for people like this and like self-help figures from Alan Watts to Jordan Peterson, depending on one, whether you want the left-wing hippie dad or the, the disciplinarian right-wing dad, um, you can find them online. And, uh, but they're all like kind of the hook that they get you with um, is people sort of wondering, like having, I think that yearning for something spiritual. And I think what he's pointing to is like, maybe art and religion they share this kind of quality of being able to like stir those feelings in people. Yeah. And maybe through that, we can try and like start to direct or root out or change or like do that. He talks about another uh, part of this book of human to human because he heard this chapter. He, he says we need a new chemistry of concepts and feelings. Um, and so chemistry of like, we should be able to like, look at like, I don't know that this, the feelings or sentiments that this kind of art stirs in somebody. And then find maybe maybe like eventually develop a science of figuring out how do we cultivate the feelings we want and yeah how do we bring that feeling don't. out of people how do we get people to become artists in a sense right yeah or find their find like their their uh, answer to the metaphysical need so to speak that they have yeah. Um, and so like pull yeah. the fire out of them right yeah that it's not and and i think he's because he is sort of seeing at this point and his ideas aren't fully formed yet hmm. um but i i think he had that insight of what would you say i mean because he writes about it in his journals there's going to be some people who are going to fall into nihilism um i know you've talked about the death of god before in the podcast so I think most people would be kind of familiar with it, but just the general decline in religion. Yeah. He sees a lot of people are going to fall into nihilism, but there's going to be a lot of people are going to want to be romantics or they're going to get mm. stricken by like wanting to go back to the old religion yeah. and the old orthodoxy and belief. And I think this is what he's seeing is like, maybe art can provide this alternative. Um, yeah. So um, I don't know. Did, did you have any other thoughts on that or? Yeah, well, so have you ever heard the song Make Art Not Friends by Sturgill Simpson? I haven't. I, I've listened to Sturgill Simpson, but I don't know if I could, like, identify that particular song. Is it on the newer album or the one that he did, like, the anime? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's a good yep. for it? Okay. Yep. So Sound I've heard, like, that album. Yeah. Yeah, but so it's when I'm stuff, thinking man. about that song title, I'm in a lot of ways I'm thinking of Nietzsche, right? Cause I'm, cause like make art, not friends. What does that mean? So when you have a really good uh, friendship with someone, it's almost like, it's like art in a sense, like you're making art with them. Like you're like the way that you uh, talk to them and everything. It's, it's like almost, it's like a work of art. It's like a dance. It's like a song, you know? And what he's like saying here is like make art not friends you know like because what's a friend they're kind of just someone that like you have fun with and they make you feel comfortable right but what's art it's it's something that you're passionate about it's like something that like drives you it's like it's like a fire it's love you know so that's kind of mm -hmm. like the only thing that i have to, to add to that because like when because when nietzsche declared that that god is dead he's saying oh like this thought is unbelievable so what are we to do you know, are we going to delve into nihilism? Are we going to just delve back into like comfort? Are we going to drink ourselves to death? What are we going to do? And then what he says is, okay, well, let's become gods ourselves. Let's make art, not friends. Right. Right. Yeah. It's well, yeah, because the, the creation of values is like an artistic act. And a world, I yeah. mean, that's actually the first formulation that he comes up with mm -hmm. for replacing religion and birth of tragedy is saying, okay, uh, so life is no longer justified as, you know, from a religious standpoint, maybe it can be justified aesthetically. Yeah. And that's like his early sort of project. Um, what's interesting is that here um, he's, he's almost wondering if, if art arts no longer seems to be like the, the, redemption of mankind or the justification for life in and of itself right it's like he's mm -hmm. he's thinking we can for the kind of person who has 
the maybe the fortitude, the intellectual fortitude for this, art could transition them away into a philosophical life. And then eventually after yes. Human to Human, he, he has this uh, concept of the gay science, which is the name of the book, uh, one of the books that comes after this, which is the idea of like an artistic science or, yeah. um, you know, himself being an artistic Socrates, basically, because mm. um, Socrates is famously yeah. didn't like art. Um, so uh, it, like finding, <laughs> kind of unifying that, uh, that contradiction in the Western psyche mm. becomes a big uh, issue for him. But um, yeah, what I was thinking of when you were saying make art, not friends, I was also thinking of like, that's a great, like Nietzsche, if he was like an 80s punk would have that on like a bumper sticker on his computer. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, because <laughs> yeah, he was basically wrote a ton of things about how solitude is great. Yes. And um, yeah, that's where you're, uh, that's where you're, you really get a good like harvest of your ideas is that in solitude. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think anyone that you love is a work of art. Just like the, mm. just like what you feel uh, when you love someone is what you feel when you're writing art. Like when I write philosophy, like I feel the same um, as when I feel the feeling of love. That's interesting. So, cause I have like kind of my, I have a hypothesis on the function that art sort of fulfills. I think it comes out of religion. Mm -hmm. Um like we have religious ritual and that's yeah. where you first have um, people having these experiences of like that involve like music and dance mm -hmm. and uh, drama and things of that nature. And then later carving of religious icons and things like that, that are attempting to like, I don't know, bridge the, the chasm between uh, uh, between minds or, or to have communion you know, in, yeah. in, in the religious sense, but also in a, like an emotional sense, make you feel something. And I think that maybe coming at that same idea you just said, but from the opposite angle, I often have the experience when I really resonate with a, a work of art that I feel like I know the creator. Like, I feel like I'm making, to put it, to put it in simple terms, I'm making a friend in that way or loving, I'm learning, I'm loving that person. Yes in experiencing part of their psyche that I'm touching through their art, um, you know, yes. whether it be a painting or song or whatever, this is something they've like dredged up out of themselves. And so um, I think there's like that same feeling of communion, um, which, you know, the communion ritual in Christianity, the whole point of that is it's like, it's an artistic representation, a symbolic representation of the fact that like man was expelled from like, being one with God communion is literally like, you're now one with God again. Um, and so like, you're coming back into the, into that union with like yeah. the divine. Um, and so I think it's kind of similar. I mean, if I can just speak blasphemously, I I've experienced that communion, like with like a cannibal corpse song or, but equally, you know, with like uh, Mahler or like also like um, it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, beautiful in the, in the traditional sense. It's just the experience of like touching something in, or ex having a connection with something from someone's, you know, deep inside there's their, their deep sentiments, what's in their heart basically. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I guess that's like where I see the commonality between art and religion. Yeah. The well, common... <laughs> well, they're like transmitting. Cause when you speak to someone, uh, you can like, you know, you can say some words, you can like use some body expressions, but uh, it doesn't always really convey like what you feel, right? It, oh, yeah. Like it doesn't really put the other person in your shoes. But when you write something that's beautiful or when you sing something, it, it kind of it puts the audience inside of your head just for a little bit for like three minutes or for like five minutes or, or like however long you're reading that and however long you're feeling that feeling with them. Yeah. And when it's somebody like it can be so like with Nietzsche going back to talking about what we were at the beginning with his style, mm -hmm. it feels a lot of the time where he's sort of like, like if I were to, to give, give like a little uh, a metaphor, you're like walking up a mountain path and he's leading and he's like, 
beckoning from in front saying like, come on, yes. come on, my friend up into the heights. And so that's why it's super exciting. Whereas like, if you read someone like uh, Shia Ran, like Emil Shia Ran, if, yeah. have you ever read any of his? No, work? but I've read Aristotle. I'm sure it's the same. Okay. Well, Shia Ran <laughs> is, is like a depressive philosopher. And so if you spend a lot of time in his head, it's really, it can be exhausting. Yeah, um, because it's almost so emotionally like gut wrenching that you're you're yeah. just drained at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, and so and then there are some people, yeah, like Kant, where it's just um, <laughs> it's not like any kind of adventure. It's like it's just too like know, mathematical. Go to, like going to the tax office or some shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's my metaphor for that. But yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to that that second paragraph. Um, cool. Do you so have I guess open? I'll yeah I'll read this one. Uh, cool. This is Human All to Human one thirty one, and this one's a little shorter. Quote: However much one thinks he has lost the habit of religion, he has not lost it to the degree that he would not enjoy encountering religious feelings and moods without any conceptual content. As for example in music end quote damn that kind of touches on what we were just talking about yeah it does and it's interesting because he's just the way he chooses to phrase it too is that well which is maybe why i was kind of had that inkling that he's got in mind maybe the person who's like post-religious or um like the modern person who's not as religious as people used to be and which is you know, kind of what was happening around his own day Um, and pointing out to that person, you still have some of that same like hardware that makes you responsive um, and that you have a similar kind of um, religious mood when you're, you know, experiencing something like in music. Um, Well, I know that he said um, in his writings, well, all right, just as a caveat, he said what I'm about to quote from him because his father was a pastor or a priest or whatever you want to call him. But he said that the philosopher has within him the blood of the priests. And I think what yeah. he was speaking to here was that the philosopher, like they're still connected to that sort of religious feeling, like the feeling that that religion brings on that feeling of meaning and like uh, having something to like guide you through the dark labyrinth of death and destruction that life is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, I, so I've heard, I'm trying to remember where I heard this description of philosophy, but that, um, one of it's one of the best descriptions I've ever heard of like what philosophy actually is yeah and that if you define it by the function it serves in societies if you like look at everywhere where philosophy arises it mostly arises as um a critique of religion that or yeah or you know you could say like the morality of society basically philosophers crop up at a certain point in complex societies mm-hmm. um and critique the metaphysical and moral claims. Mm -hmm. And so you can see this as kind of productive in a certain way, because like uh, Nietzsche said, yeah, Nietzsche says in, I think it's in the Don where he says that, uh, um, he says that, uh, or no, I think it's in Twilight of Idols. He says, are we immoralists harming morality? Uh, No more than um, anarchists harm princes when they shoot at them. Um, like, it, cause basically in, and he goes on to say how it's like, whenever a prince is being like, uh, you know, in his realm has unrest from anarchists and, and, and socialists, it like strengthens his rule and makes him able to claim more power. And so he says, he concludes the aphorism with like the moral of the story is that morality must be shot at in order to make it stronger. And so that you could see the philosopher as like, a, um, you know, it's a, it's something, it's an anti-fragile element of society making your religion more, um, it, it should be serving the function of making your religion like more complete and coherent. Yeah. Uh, I think part of Nietzsche's problem with Socrates is that he he just like saws off the tree limb that he's sitting on kind of, it's like the, mm. the rational uh, mode. But I think you're right that it's like the priest 
the philosopher kind of like, he, he comes out of the, the past, if we're speaking of like antiquity, um, the people who are like philosophers, so to speak, the further back in society you go, the more that figure becomes basically just synonymous with a priest, like, or yeah. with some sort of religion, like the earliest philosophy is all religious philosophy. And then you finally get in like the Western canon in Greece, you get some of these um, figures who are kind of critical of religion. And then in the East, you could say uh, you get like Taoist figures. Um, yeah. it's, well, we call them Taoist, but um, that li- it's kind of a misnomer. That's a whole can of worms we don't need to get into here. But yeah. there's always sort of that like uh, that like self critique coming out of it that philosophy serves. And well, so it's a critique, and it's also seeking for truth and knowledge, right? Because well, you yeah. have to critique things. You have to critique known systems of knowledge. I'll put that in air quotes um, in order to find. M- more knowledge because knowledge is kind of like a it's like a tool that you have to keep like upgrading it's like a it's like an app on your phone that like keeps getting updated like every week right that's kind of what knowledge well, it's like is. having having true beliefs kind of requires that you eliminate you make sure that they're not you're eliminating false beliefs and yes. so it's sort of that um yeah i mean and, and various philosophers who are like epoch setting have basically done that they basically just sort of reformulated that central premise. Mm. So, you know, Socrates had his dialectical method. Uh, more than a thousand years later, you have Descartes. Um, well, I mean, almost 2,000 years later, you have Descartes, who um, has his methodology of doubt. I'm going to doubt everything that can be doubted um, in order to find what is indubitable, basically. And so, yeah, it's like a, there's like this, there's this like mad truth seeking element uh at the in inside every philosopher that's like a little bit crazed and has that retains that aspect of the the religious mind you could say that is that is like i don't know i think why a lot of philosophers they reach the end of knowledge so to speak they realize the limits of human epistemology and they get into like mysticism or um things of that nature like what uh Gano, um, I believe his name is pronounced as a Frenchman. It's like a great example of that. Um, uh, oh, it's, he was like, it's, it's spelled Ganoa, right? Uh, it's spelled G U E N O N, and he was oh, like an Oriental scholar. Um, but basically, in the end, like uh, converted to like a mystical form of Islam um, after like a lifetime of wow. philosophy. Um, and there's a couple figures like that. Um, like you could even say Schopenhauer, right? Um, it got really enamored with um, Buddhism. Like he called himself a Buddhaist. Um, a Buddhaist. Like hyphenated. Yeah, because I, I guess the word Buddhist wasn't like really in the common parlance yet. Well, um, so there's this guy that I had on podcasts. His name's Ruel Minet. And he kind of studies, he studies Buddhism uh, just for it because he's getting his doctorate. And he was telling me how like calling it Buddhism kind of defeats the purpose of Buddhism because not, it, mm. it was never supposed to be a dogma, kind of like uh, Taoism, right? That was kind of like mm. that thing that you were saying about just like, yeah, they call them Taoists, but we shouldn't get into that right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I've, I've heard that argument with Buddhism as well. Um, what is it? Well, especially when you get into Zen, like Huang, Huangbo has that uh, famous line where he says that, uh, the Dharma of all Dharmas, which is like the, the teaching of all teaching is that there are no teachings. Um, yeah. And so, but then now that this teaching of no teaching has been handed down, how can that be a teaching? Um, so it's kind of like the, the problem is you get into like linguistic paradoxes when you're, when you really are upfront about <laughs> certain things uh, in logic and metaphysics, but um, yes. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where if I want to get. We could definitely get into the weeds on Buddhism because I I studied it for many years um, and I've got all sorts of opinions on it. But um, I yeah, don't know. I don't know how far you want to go down that the middle let's, path. Uh, let's read this next line, and then if it comes up again, we'll get into it. Cool. Human, all too human, section one hundred and fifty. Art raises its head where religions decline. 
takes over a number of feelings and moods produced by religion, clasps them to its heart, then becomes itself deeper, more soulful, so that it is able to communicate exaltation and enthusiasm. The wealth of religious feeling, swollen to a river, breaks out again and again and seeks to conquer new realms. The growing enlightenment has shaken the dogmas of religion and generated a mistrust of it. Therefore, feeling forced out of the religious sphere by enlightenment throws itself into art. Yeah, that's, um, that's still <laughs> very close to everything we've been talking about, but kind of thinking about at the end of it there. And maybe, so this is an it interesting throws phenomenon. throws itself into art. Yeah, and, and so this is an interesting phenomenon that you, your audience may or may not be aware of, um, but it was a really <laughs> more, maybe morbidly interesting uh, series of events that happened around like, I want to say 95 uh, in Norway, where, um, so there was a style of heavy metal called black metal, which originated sort of uh, in uh, opposition to death metal. They thought a lot of the death metal had gotten too soft. Um, yeah. And one of uh, like, there's an incredibly corny line by one of the people, one of the, the, the culprits in these series of crimes who said, uh, why don't they just call it life metal? Um, so like really, <laughs> really cheesy, but um, basically that guy um, whose name was um, Euronymous, uh, him and Varg Virkinus, who that dude is still, by the way, you can find, he's like a, a weird, like neo-pagan, like pseudo-Nazi kind of, he's um, a, like, he went to prison for many years. Um, basically they did a string of like church burnings and, uh, and murders and it, and it culminated in Varg murdering Euronymous. Yeah. Um, who were in the same like black metal band together called Mayhem. Uh, there were also a couple suicides, a couple like random killings, like outside of the black metal community. But basically um, that, that series of incidents, like the Norwegian, like satanic murders and church burnings and all that, Yeah. Um, because it was motivated. So it, they, they were largely like, just uh, they were largely kids. I mean, a lot of these guys were like 18 or 19 um, and they were, you know, living really, how, how would you put it uh like very like sort of low life lifestyles like just drinking doing drugs having promiscuous sex all the time um didn't have jobs didn't do anything they're just playing black metal and uh but so you know you can kind of just say well they were just trying to be edgy but a lot of them did kind of express these satanic beliefs and it's always kind of like fascinated me because and the main reason why is because norway is one of the best places on earth that you could live yeah. Like if you just think about like historically of all the like souls that have been alive in this, on this earth um, to be, to be born in Norway, you hit the jackpot. Like it's, you it's have, beautiful. have you been there? It's a beautiful country. I have not, I've been to Sweden and Sweden's gorgeous, but um, no, yeah, I've, I've seen pictures and it looks gorgeous. Um, yes. It's the fjords and everything. Mm -hmm. Um but not only that, I mean, it's like you have not only that the most forgiving prison system on earth, you've got a good welfare state, you've got um, that seems to be functional because you've got a ton of oil. Um, and you've got all these like just the modern conveniences and the, like the life expectancy and the reported quality of life and happiness with it is typically through the roof. And so then the idea of like, so you're growing up in that society. And you adopt basically what is a form of militant nihilism and death worship yeah. Uh, and decide to like kill people and burn. And these churches that they're burning, like, so if you're listening to this and you're in America, your conception of like what a church is, is probably pretty ugly and like utilitarian looking. Yeah. Um, but these were it's like, like, it's on the side of like a, like a strip mall. It's got like a weird, right. you know, it's, <laughs> Yeah, they've got the little like white uh, marquee sign or, or not marquee, yeah. but the sandwich board or whatever it's called. Um, yeah, or just like, I mean, we're used to just like mostly, I mean, there's a couple nice Catholic churches in some of the old East Coast cities and there's like some Spanish yeah. missions, yeah. but mostly um, our conception of a church is just like a little Protestant like square or rectangular building with maybe a steeple. Um and so, but the, so the churches they were burning in Norway are like historical artifacts. They're like these like ancient wooden churches that are gorgeous. Um, and it, it was like, so it was, it wasn't just like, 
I mean, it was being an edgy teenager, but it was more like similar to like, you'll occasionally hear about people going and destroying art, right? In a museum, yeah. like pouring acid on a famous painting or something. It was more akin to that, I would say. But like they're depriving yeah. the world of something beautiful and um, killing each other. And, and one of the guys committed like a homophobic, like hate crime, murdered a guy um, wow. for being gay. Wow. So it's like, these are not like people to idolize and a lot of people in the middle community like make that mistake. Um, but so anyway, that, that all puzzled me of like, okay, you're born into this closest to ideal society you can have. And your response to it is to be the most um, vindictive, destructive, and militantly nihilistic like that you can be. And I don't know, I, the only explanation I can come to in my mind is that it points to some sort of confirmation of Nietzsche's like worry about nihilism because these are also some of the most like irreligious societies just in terms yeah. of how secular they are. And that I'm just wondering like, okay, so if you've been given really no meaning for your life at all, mm. um, maybe that like, and, and so to bring this back to the aphorism we just read of like, cause I've, sorry, I've kind of gone off on this long tangent. But, no, 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 uh, no worries. I feel it's interesting. Uh, but because it's like, they like, they spiritualize these feelings by com- by making it into a, like a religion, like a satanic religion. And they, they express themselves through art. And the thing is, this didn't really end in the nineties because there was a band called dissection um, that was playing into the two thousands. The main, the main guy in that band murdered somebody, got out of jail and then killed himself. And there's still a band um, around today called Watain. It's one of the most popular black metal bands in the world. And they're part of his same like little cult that he was part of. Mm -hmm. Um, And they call their shows rituals and they do all this and that. So it's like, it's weird. It's like, it's like (laughs) there, there's like this nihilistic uh, religion that's like been created. And then they're, they call themselves different. The bands call themselves cults and they call the shows rituals. And so it's like this, this like pathological version of the religious feeling has like literally thrown itself into art. And then it's like, they're trying to like spread around their nihilism, like a virus kind of. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know, I, I guess I'll turn it over to you to respond to the, or if that has any neurons firing for you, but yeah, well, uh, it's, it's like one of the more interesting phenomena I'm aware of that happened. Um, I mean, it's disturbing. Oh yeah. Well, sure. Absolutely. But it's from a, from a philosophical angle or from like a psychological angle. Well, I think what's uh-huh. going on here is that they were so, like, they were so, like, because I'm assuming, like, at one point, they were, like, super religious, right? Mm-hmm. And then, like, at one point, they kind of just felt like they were lied to or something. And then that kind of just made them, like, angry. But, like, they still needed something to believe in. So and then they kind of went down that path of, like, worshiping, like, anger, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a spiritualization of like negativity, basically. Yeah, um, which just doesn't seem like something that should be spiritual. Well, well, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna be one to say whether it should or should not be spiritualized, but but it's something that can like essentially bring everything like into flames, sort of a deal. <clears throat> well, and it's interesting because there was like the. Um, there was the uh, the thuggy cult in India, um, like Kali worship, which yeah, what's that's that like one? the yeah. Well, well, and so I don't, I'm not really aware of any other like other world historical example other than like the Kali like thuggy cults of people actually doing like real death worship um, of which it's just, I don't know. It's weird to me that that's where, that's where we see that pop up in the modern age is in like <laughs> the most, the most luxuriating like country on earth basically. Um, and so I don't yeah. know. It's, it's, it just seems like a very weird phenomenon, but it is, it is kind of similar to actually how Nietzsche describes Christianity in so far as you're like denying the world, but yeah. rather than doing it out of this like pitying, like, it's like, it's like if you're, it's just being just rebellious, just taking the opposite mm-hmm. orientation. If your society is super pitying, 
trying to take care, relieve everyone's suffering, saying, you know what, fuck that. I want more suffering. Um, and yeah, so maybe well, it's like some... getting the wrong idea. Mm-hmm. Cause I know, mm-hmm. cause like when you were, cause you just did that episode on free will, right? Mm-hmm. And I noticed that when people want to deny like a dogma, like some sort of like way of thought, like they're being free will, right? When people say, cause like they deny free will because uh, the philosophy that free will is based upon, they don't like, or they disagree with. Right. And what, what that does is that that makes them think, okay, so there is no free will because it turns like, it's that binary thinking, binary logic. Like, well, if it's not mm-hmm. this, then it must be the opposite of this. But that's just not the, that's the wrong idea, right? Um, it's like some mix between, it's not even, it might not even, like that might not even be a good question of whether or not there is free will or not. That's just kind of a bad question um, because free will in and of itself is a concept formed by human beings, um, which right. kind of makes it just kind of a thing that we think about. Well, it's like you deny, yeah, it's like you deny free will, but then like a lot of people, their con- their next conclusion is like, oh, well, I'm just controlled by yeah. causes. <laughs> and it's, uh, I, there's actually a passage I didn't mention in that episode uh, that is from, I want to say it's from Human All to Human, one of the later yeah. books. I didn't listen to the whole says, episode, by the way, because I, uh, I had just, because the, the last episode that I heard from yours is was posted on the like before the 24th so i Mm. had just found out about that episode like today like just now oh Um, cool but yeah continue yeah that's all good yeah well this one i didn't even he basically nietzsche talks about uh muhammadan or muhammadan fatalism uh and let me uh, actually find the passage because he he's basically pointing out how um there are how would you say like what he's concerned with is not so much like where you come down on the like the details of your like dogma or the doctrine that you want to have for free will he he's really more interested in like what's psychologically going on in you that's producing your beliefs yeah so that's that's like a totally opposite orientation from the way a lot of people see beliefs where it's like the a belief is something like freely chosen. Um, whereas for Nietzsche, the belief is like a, it's a post hoc effect of, um, you know, how would you put it? Like the way your, the way your instincts would push you or yeah. the direction your instincts would push you in. And so um, what he is really concerned with um, is, are you coming to like your belief in determinism because you just want to, like absolve yourself of responsibility um do you want to feel like you're controlled and that you're and so i just looked up the passage it's from wanderer and his shadow 61 so it's the third book of human to human um and so this is he says it's muhammadan fatalism so he's talking about islam basically so we'll set aside whether this is an accurate description of islam because i'm not sure if i trust nietzsche to actually give me an accurate description of Islam, but this is what he says it is. I'll just yeah. read a little bit from it. He says, Mohammedan fatalism embodies the fundamental error of setting man and fate over against one another as two separate things. Man, it says, can resist fate and seek to frustrate it, but in the end, it always carries off the victory so that the most reasonable thing to do is resign oneself or to just live as one pleases. In reality, every man is himself a piece of fate. When he thinks to resist fate in the way suggested is precisely fate that is here fulfilling itself. The struggle is imaginary, but so is the proposed resignation to fate. All these imaginings are enclosed within fate. Um, And so I'll just stop it there. But I think that's Mm -hmm. like the, the way, I think that's a really elegant way of understanding it of um, you can, you can reject free will and still not feel like you're being compelled because you can say, my fate is who I am. Like this is within myself. Um, Like the things compelling me are things like my own instincts and my own desires. And like, what is a better description of what you are than your desires? Um, I mean, that's your wills, right? Right. Yeah. Or wills or drives or however Nietzsche would put it. 
But um, it's, yeah, it's funny. Like a lot of the time in the free will debate, people want to exclude like every, <laughs> what would you put it? They want to try and like exclude everything that makes you, you, and then say that what remains is free will or, you know, or whatever the case may be, whatever their yeah, position it's just, is. I mean, it's just, it's like, it's honestly just kind of psychotic. I mean, it's just like, it's just kind of, it's just entirely illogical to like think in that way because it's just like, it's so many factors go into how you act as a person that it's impossible to even know, or even think about even beginning to know whether there is free will or not. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also, how would I put it? So, so that's why in the episode, I try to like focus in on the issue of like, moral responsibility and like the will is like this uncaused cause which is like really what i take issue with um i don't really care what people call you know their beliefs at the end of the day but it's like if you think there's this like if you think there's like this um the way nietzsche puts it in another passage like this neutral substrate between yourself and your actions mm -hmm. that like can basically decide whether to basically whether to act within your own nature um, yeah and so he's basically saying like the reason why we separate the deed from the doer is so that we can blame people for what their nature is and, and that's like mm -hmm. abs as absurd as blaming a predator for being a predator um you know and so that's like the myth i'm sort of like interested in removing but then beyond that like you shouldn't then feel like oh because my will isn't this cause unto itself that i'm therefore like enslaved by de a deterministic, like mechanistic universe. Cause it's just like, that's not what I experience. I, I don't feel that way. Like I feel like I have a, yeah, I have a certain nature or a certain character or whatever, but, and that's what I, I act according to that. I don't like yeah. blame people for it, but I'm also not like thinking, um, Oh, everyone's like a cog in this mechanistic machine. Cause mm -hmm. I, I don't know, kind of like you were saying before we started rolling or the, with the recording it's like i don't know <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm not gonna make these like ontological claims about reality um mm -hmm. based on like causality being the ultimate explanation of everything so well it's just uh, like a huge web of things going on i mean there's just uh i mean it's like a river right i mean there's no like you can't really say that the beginning of the river is the cause of the end of the river because the water then gets evaporated it's just like a whole cycle right. with, with million like there's gravity that comes into play there's the right you could say the end of the river is the cause of the beginning of it just as yeah easily. it's all kind of just a big swirling that, uh, wind of heraclitus paintings there's a heraclitus fragment that the the road up and the road down are the same road yeah um, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah i like that guy um, uh, is, is he also the one that said you, you can't step in the same river twice? He is, yeah. Um, it, which I think is an awesome... Uh, it, it's it, it's an, as amazing of an utterance as his, like, um, he's got, like, a descendant, quote-unquote, you know, an, an ideological or philosophical descendant that appears in Plato's dialogues, whose name escapes me, who he goes so far as to say, well, you can't even step in the same river once. And personally, I think that's, yeah. that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the first thing Harris Clytus said was, was cool. Um, he, he tried to, he tried to, he, he tried to push a little too far, but yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's the, the idea, the idea that the river is not a, it's not a static essentialized thing. It's identity actually derives from change. Um, yeah. Which is, um, I think Nietzsche and Internalize that to a large degree. I think that that's a nice like skeleton key for explaining how he thinks about a lot of things. Yeah, this other guy that I had on the podcast, uh, Martin Goodson, he kind of explained um, like how how Buddhists like kind of explain life is that it's just a continuous, like ever continuous series of transformations. Like from every moment, you're transferring yourself into mm -hmm. the next moment. Yeah, you could even see that, like, there's, like, a certain school of thought that you're reborn every minute that I've heard. Um, so yeah. we're, that's, like, a nice pithy response of your teaching Buddhism. And a student's like, I don't know if I believe in reincarnation. You can say, well, you're, you were reincarnated 
six times since you walked in the door. door here. <laughs> but, um, and I'll, I'll totally, I'll steal this reference from Alan Watts, but I remember one of his lectures where he, he turned me on to a poem by T.S. Eliot for Quartets, where he, uh, there's a line in there where Eliot writes that the man who sits down in the train car to read the newspaper is not the same man who came in um, yeah. onto the train. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's that idea is, um, it's, it's, it's mostly been expressed by poets to bring it back to art, um, you know, and, and in religion, you don't really, and, and, and by when you get it from a philosopher like Heraclitus, Heraclitus is very, lyrical philosopher yeah. so we're very poetic on the poetic side of things well and then we have the physicists who actually prove that you aren't the same person every like in any moment because like all the atoms of your body just like move oh, like in every right. second right yeah I, nietzsche would probably have a problem with that because he didn't like uh atomism but yeah i think he would agree with the spirit of it um, well if, if nietzsche w- woke up in the 1941 when they blew off the first atomic bomb I think right he'd be, <laughs> right he'd, be, he'd have to write another book yeah he might have a different opinion <laughs> i'm not sure that well because his, his thing with atomism is kind of his same critique of cause and effect right yeah. he, he wouldn't he wouldn't say that atoms aren't real but just mm-hmm. like it's sort of like turtles all the way down right yeah like yeah yes, and I so know. democritus's idea of atomism of basically like the all units are made up of smaller units and eventually there's mm-hmm. like a small a smallest unit called the atom i think that's what he kind of he liked um there was a polish guy uh, or no 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 he wasn't polish he was croatian um physicist named uh, boscovich that he really liked that he had an idea called force point theory um that was force basically he thought theory. everything was like uh he thought that like the how would you put it like the fundamental nature of matter was it was all fields that were like extended portions of space or what what have you yeah and there are there are some physicists who do lean in that angle that that direction now that fields actually are what's underlying everything i don't don't know definitely makes more sense really talk about this um well i think like it's probably some like mixture between the two as most things are but of course you know we're not physicists so Right. I've tried to watch um, because Boscovich is like just now starting to get some like credibility among like a lot of the scientific communities kind of now retrospectively said, you know, this guy might have been on something. And I've watched some YouTube stuff trying to learn about it. And I'm just constantly reminded how little I understand physics whenever I try to learn more about it. Um, Well, so like another thing is that like sometimes like just because something works um, because uh, you thought that something was made up of like or like something held like a certain amount of properties because of xyz just because your invention worked because you thought that way doesn't prove right exactly you're thinking right there's um yeah you can you can observe things but that doesn't mean your framework's actually explanatory mm-hmm. um yeah, no, that's I. I'm definitely on the same page on that one, and that I think, I think that's kind of why um, I don't know Nietzsche's view on a lot of things, like because a lot of people will call him like an irrationalist or a, a postmodernist or like a proto postmodernist. Yeah. I think in some ways, um, and I, maybe I'll get in trouble with the philosophical community for saying this, but I think in some <laughs> ways Nietzsche is like a pragmatist in some yeah. sense uh oh that like would, uh, just like heavily he's extremely a pragmatist like right um, like, like, so like you have to have some scientific language or some like mm-hmm. set of concepts to do anything yeah. and yeah like in a thousand years all of your science is going to be looked at as backwards but um you just have to get the results that's like what you need basically uh, yeah like you yeah. like at some point like you got to build a house right like you have to build it at, right. at some point like all the plans like you know you can't sit there worrying about the or... atom the atoms that make up the concrete foundation or whatever like, yeah. <laughs> like i'm not sure i have a full understanding of like quantum physics so i don't know yeah. if i could build this house yet it might the house might be there and not there at the same yeah. time um oh, man. yeah all right uh 
That's how it is at Schrodinger's house. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, how about this? This is a long paragraph. So uh, maybe you read the first one and then I'll read the second yeah. one and then we'll discuss it. Cool. Sounds good. So this is uh, 217, uh, still in human to human. The, the title of the whole aphorism is the decentralization of higher art. Uh, quote, because the artistic development of modern music has forced the intellect to un undergo an extraordinary training, our ears have become increasingly intellectual. Thus, we can now endure much greater volume, much greater noise, because we are much better trained than our forefathers forefather were to listen for the reason in it. All our senses have in fact become somewhat dulled because we always inquire after the reason, what it means and no longer what it is. Such a dullness is betrayed, for example, by the unqualified rule of tempered notes. For now, those ears still able to make the finer distinctions, say between C sharp and D flat are exceptions. In this regard, our ear has become coarsened. Furthermore, the ugly side of the world, originally inimical to the senses has been won over for music. Its area of power to express the sublime, the frightful and the mysterious has thus been astonishingly extended. Our music makes things speak that before had no tongue. Similarly, some painters have made the eye more intellectual and have gone far beyond what was previously called a joy in form and color. Here too, that side of the world originally considered ugly has been conquered by artistic understanding. What is the consequence of all this? The more the eye and ear are capable of thought, the more they reach that boundary line where they become essential. Joy is transferred to the brain. The sense organs themselves become dull and weak. More and more, the symbolic replaces that which exists. And so, as surely as on any other path, we arrive along this one at barbarism. For the present, it is still said that the world is uglier than ever but it means a more beautiful world than ever existed. But the more the perfumed fragrance of meaning is dispersed and evaporated, the rarer will be those who can still perceive it. And the rest will stay put at ugliness, seeking to enjoy it directly. Such an attempt is bound to fail. Thus we have in Germany a twofold trend in musical development. On the one side, a group of 10,000 with even higher, more delicate pretensions ever more attuned to what it means. And on the other side, the vast majority, which each year is becoming ever more capable, incapable of understanding meaning, even in the form of sensual ugliness, and is therefore learning to reach out with increasing pleasure for that which is in intrinsically ugly and repulsive, that is, the basely sensual. Hmm. Yeah, I think so. You know, as he says at the end, he's talking about a twofold trend in musical development in Germany. But like that last section feels like he's predicting trends in art today that you have like, it's not net, like 10,000 people. There's actually probably way more. Um, there's probably less of a class distinction than ever with this, right? Yeah. But there's like people who get really into the intellectual side of art. They're watching art films. Yeah. Um, they're into classical art, fine art, symphonies, operas. Um, and he's basically kind of, it's interesting because like a lot of the passage we've, passages we've been reading, right? Nietzsche is kind of like expressing his hope that maybe we can deal with a lot of this like religious gunk through art. Um, and, and, and it's like a gateway into the philosophical way of life. And then here he's almost, he's almost like doubling back and saying, but wait a minute, there's this other kind of trend though, where people are being like almost overly rational or overly philosophical with yeah. their in intake of art where they're just worried about what it means and not they're cutting, they're being unartistic about art. Um, yeah. And then, and then when the other side of things is like the vast majority who are just getting into the basically sensual elements of art. And so that, I think of that, like <laughs> that, well, that trailer, those. that trailer sound that, blah, yeah. that Hans Zimmer like innovated. That's what I think of a, like people who like the basically sensual art is like, mm. um, it's almost a cliche at this point to like call it, but like, you know, transformers or whatever, like that's the vast majority are just like sensory overload, 
Like I'm going to yeah. the theater to eat popcorn and see like, just like a complete over excitation of like yeah. sound and visuals with no meaning to it at all. And yeah. then there's like other people who are like, oh no, art is all brainy and they're not getting the sensual angle. Um, and so, I don't know, even though he's talking about his own time, like it seems really relevant to today. Um, yeah, I mean, because so have you seen the Brave New World TV series? No, I didn't know there was one. Yeah, dude, it's it's so good. It's it's new. Okay. It's on this new streaming site called Peacock. Um, OK, cool. But you've read the book, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. But so it, in the does TV it adhere series, like. What does it adhere to the book? Uh, yeah, uh, and at some points it almost does a better job. Okay, cool. I believe um, it. it's 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 really good. Um, okay, but there's this one point where like John the Savage he lets like one of the Brave New World people like listen to some of his music, and mm-hmm. then oh, it was Bernard. He lets Bernard listen to some of his music, and then Bernard says, "Oh, that's weird. You have words in your music." And then John the mm-hmm. Savage says, yeah, we wanted it to mean something. Right. Yeah. It's like, they're still like when they're in the, what do they call that zone? Like the, I, don't know, like I the forget Savage what, if there's like a name for it. Yeah. Something like that. But it's like, they, those are still like complete people basically <laughs> Yeah. in some respect, even though it sucks, like it's shown to not be fun. Um. But you need but, a not so fun environment to be a real person in a sense. Right. Yes, absolutely. Well, dude, and that's, that, it's interesting because um, I think um, to just make a more lowbrow reference, like the movie Demolition Man is that, like, I always associated that with like yeah. a very brave new world-esque future because everyone listens to ad jingles. Like that's what plays on the radio. <laughs> um is like that they're like oh it's this is the classic station and it's like the yeah. jolly green giant like theme or whatever yeah um and so it's just like everything's become mindless and everyone's been really dumbed down and they um uh-huh. you know are very uh what like uh, there's like enforced politeness and everything and you have to like if you swear you get like a fine yeah. um that's right yeah yeah it's pretty funny but again like that's all it's a whole movie about how basically a master criminal gets out of the cryo prison and they have to get sylvester stallone who's an old style cop because none of the cops in their future can actually handle violence like it's so peaceful that they like they don't know what to do um and so it's it's like rediscover like they have to um it's actually a a very nietzsche movie they have to bring they they keep calling him a caveman so they have to bring this real person from the past into their like fake perfectly managed world because they're also like fragile now that they can't handle any problems Mm -hmm. um whereas in brave new world uh i always what i loved was it's like i think pretty much the last major scene where they're talking to mustafa mond i want to say is his name Is like one of the like 10 or however many there are like like hyper intelligent people who run their whole yeah. society and he's like completely aware of like yeah i know the trade-off we made but it's better for people to be safe and content and happy and it's like the bf skinner kind of view of humanity like people just need yeah. like certain pleasures or whatever so anyway i like that is definitely the kind of art that i feel like people are yeah. taking in now uh, it's like yeah. sort of the mind like it's just mere entertainment basically mm-hmm. no i think you'll find that like the tv series is almost more satisfying like the ending okay cool it's just kind of like i don't know you got to watch it i'm not going to give anything away but you they keep, get it are they going to like keep going or is it just like no they it's, just do one, it's one probably done. just one season that like just okay, like because cool. it basically just no, that's goes perfect. through the book so perfect but in a if, new, they, if they were to make way. it in because that's what they did with uh man in the high castle which is a philip k dick novel okay um okay. basically the first season is like the book and then they kept going for like three more seasons and it wasn't as yeah. good um but yeah. yeah yeah i so yeah i don't know i definitely see that um i don't know i've heard it said that our our society now much more closely matches with Brave New World than 1984, um, in spite of everyone saying it's literally 1984. Um, yeah. <laughs> mainly it's because not, it's though. like, 
It's not like come right. On. <laughs> well, I mean, and yeah, it's like the 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 like methods of quote unquote control are mostly just people getting sucked into this nightmare box that they have in their pocket at yeah. all times, mm-hmm. um, which just gives serves up like completely short term dopamine hits. Yeah. Um, and so it, I don't know. They just it's drug all, us with cell phones. It really is like having a drug like dispenser in your pocket. Yeah. And yeah. it's, so it's like a culture of just like, uh, like little entertaining distractions and snippets, mm. most of which don't mean anything. Um, and yeah. so again, I think that fits in as well. I mean, like, mm. I don't think Nietzsche could have conceived of it, but like the idea where you would just watch like a 15 second, like video of a cat. Yeah. Um, and then move on to like the next little thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we just willingly <laughs> hold like a camera to our face all day. Yeah. Oh, it's like, th- that's like the absolute atomization, like dissolving of like art <laughs> yeah. is basically where we're at now. Um, but I don't know. I, I guess I sound like a, like a curmudgeon probably, but. I mean, I, I think know. there's, there's still plenty of art to go around oh yeah and it's easier to see it now too Mm. yeah Uh, let's read this last little sentence i'll just read it um gethsemane on gethsemane the most painful thing a thinker can say to artists is could ye not watch with me one hour so i was kind of confused when i read that what does that mean so that's what Jesus says to the apostles in the garden of Gethsemane, where he's oh, basically really? waiting to get crucified. Uh, and yeah, it's a, um, I think I actually talked about this with Mina um, now that I think about it, but it's, it's yeah, you might one of my been. favorite aphorisms in human alti human on art um, that basically the metaphor he's using is, is Jesus keeps asking the, the apostles stay awake with him. So that, yeah, like, they keep falling asleep. They keep falling asleep. And so it's <laughs> like, um, I think, I don't know. I included it in here because with everything we've been talking about, um, it's like a recognition that there is like this kind of fundamental, like for all the, the, the relatedness between philosophy, religion, and art, there's like this kind of fundamental like tension between them of yeah. like truth seeking versus mm-hmm. art is kind of getting lost in the enchantment and in the illusion. Um, yeah, like Jesus versus Paul, right? Hmm, that's interesting. I didn't think about that, but yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's like it's, Paul scribbling all this like stuff down. He's like, "Dude, we got to get this in writing." And then Jesus is just like, "Hmm, you know, I'm just saying some like nice words here that that are wise." Yeah, there's a great scene in. Uh, this is going to completely spoil it, but the movie came out, I think in the eighties, a uh, movie called last temptation of Christ with Willem Dafoe as Jesus. Yeah. I don't think that's he, a spoiler. <laughs> yeah. But, but he, yes, um, yeah. he takes, he, he um, basically is given the last temptation in the movie is that he's given the option to come down off the cross and not die by being crucified. Yeah. And he goes and has a family and lives a normal life. But at one point during that sort of like the whole last like 40 minutes, of the movie is sort of like this dream of him, like, what if Jesus had had a real life? And in the end, he chooses, I want to go back to the cross and die. But in that yeah. sort of, like, dream, he meets Paul. And Paul basically completely cops to it. He's like, well, even if you weren't real, I would have needed to make you up, basically. Like, yeah, I, um, and so, and so even though Jesus says, no, everything you said was wrong, Paul's like, I'm glad I met you. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> it just, like, it, it further enforced it to me that, like, I had to invent you. Um, yeah. and so yeah it's, uh, there's definitely i don't know that's a whole nother can of worms we could talk about about jesus yeah. and paul but i guess we're probably coming up on pretty long here yeah i think we'll leave it there um but i did have one more question i wanted to ask you that i thought of before this and i kind of wanted to see your thoughts on it just before yeah, we for sure. stop the recording um so you know what cognitive dissonance is right mm-hmm so we say that like a cigarette smoker, they're practicing cognitive dissonance because there's all this evidence against smoking cigarettes because it can kill you. Um, but they just keep 
they just double down. They keep, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to keep doing it. So, but the thing is, like, are they practicing cognitive dissonance or are they just accepting that they, they and everyone else in the world is going to die? Right. Hmm. I think that uh, I kind of reserve cognitive, I think that is a form of cognitive dissonance in a way because how would I put it? I, but I think it's like, it's one of the easiest forms because we're just so bad at, yeah. at calculating risk. To it's also with. self-deprecating. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, well, it's easy to like, so you run a cost benefit analysis, right? And it's like, yeah. this will kill me, but I'm already going to die. So it's not really choice between living and dying. It's choice between like, how fast do I want to die? And yeah. so do I want to, and so it's way easier to do the risk calculation of like, well, I don't care about future me in 20 or 30 years. Yeah. I want to have a good time now. Um, it's when, and then when that future you arrives and is staring at you in the mirror, you say, oh, holy shit, why did I do this to myself? But um, yeah. <laughs> I think part of humanity and the human condition is just that we're like not able to think in that way. Mm -hmm. And so that particular kind of cognitive dissonance, I think is super easy. Um, yeah. It's yeah. what, what fascinates me is like, performative contradictions with people's ideologies mm. um and smoking can be that too uh if somebody's yeah. like i mean anything you're, that you're addicted to sure yeah. well especially if you're like smoking and like let's say you're a buddhist or something like yeah. we've been talking about that's kind of a performative contradiction in a way like, yeah um because you're like like i'm gonna be free from all my craving and habits uh yeah and then but, you light up a cigarette <laughs> right <laughs> You're meditating. But, yeah. And I'm sure, I mean, that's, that's the thing. Okay. So maybe this is a good way to like, kind of put a cork in it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've really taken from Nietzsche is that ad hominem attacks are actually great because, um, and I don't mean that literally don't go around ad hominem attacking people, but um, when somebody tells you um, you should live this way, you should take a hard look at that person's life. And I, the reason why I say this and why I'm attributing this sort of to Nietzsche is there's that whole first section of called the prejudices of philosophers and beyond good and evil, where he basically says like, yeah, this is really why Kant thought this and why Spinoza thought he psychoanalyzes philosophers mm -hmm. and says, they're just writing their own unconscious autobiography. They're telling you about themselves. Yeah. Um, and so he criticizes them based on their lives and based on mm -hmm. his assessment of their character. Yeah. Um, and, and, and in philosophy, a lot of the times we think, well, that's not really fair game. The common refrain you get from people is, well, you can separate the person from their ideas. Yeah. And I would just say, uh, I don't think you should. Um, I think you should actually ask like, okay, this person's saying I should live. I mean, I, I hate to beat up on him again, but Jordan Peterson saying, get your house yeah. in order while he has a serious benzo addiction that yeah. like casts a doubt on everything that he said. It, it's, yeah. you know, and people can say, well, his wisdom stands on its own anyway, but I'm, but I would just say as a case study, he shows, um, that it doesn't work. Right. It, you could be a giant fucking hypocrite. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. I would just say, yeah, as a final note, uh, spinning off cognitive dissonance, like it's important to kind of like figure out if there's, you're seeing some like performative contradictions from somebody. Yeah. Or at least like try to see like, where are they coming from? Right. Because, yeah, somebody could be a complete like, I'm not saying, you know, like, you know, Martin Luther King cheated on his wife or whatever. That doesn't mean the civil rights movement wasn't worth it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not, you know, this vulgar conception one way or the other. It's more just like, yeah, you should know where somebody is coming from um, and like take the full person into the evaluation. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that oh, man. that sums it up. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Greg. Uh, it's been fun. Thanks for coming on, Keegan. And uh, for what, what are you going to call this episode? Uh, I'll, I'll probably. I'm sorry, just... I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe a. Uh, um, I'll probably call it. Because, like, usually I just like if I'm interviewing someone, I do it like That's the name the of name. the person. Yeah. And I say the. But like, since you didn't give me a last name, I'll probably go like. Keegan. Oh, 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 yeah, it's Keegan Kelson. I'll send it to you. Keegan uh, Kelson. The spelling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll if send you're you the spelling, because it'll like, throw you off. No, yeah, no, I didn't want it. 
I just didn't want to like uh, like pressure you if that was like a privacy thing or anything. But no, uh, that's all good. I've all right. I've doxed myself already by this point, so yeah, <laughs> which means right, cool. I'm undoxable. Cool, cool, yeah, uh, awesome. So, and then I'll put the link to your podcast in the description for everyone to look at. And with that being said, thank you for listening.